Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. I have a big smile on my face, okay? Because I know what I'm going to talk about today. And you don't yet, but you will. Let's get into it. This is dealing with our bodies being the temple, God being the builder and maker of this temple. And wow, did he do, um, I would use the word interesting, and I think that undermines how God framed this body together. That's a clue. We're going to talk about the frame of this building that we have. Because, I mean, I worked in construction. I, I kind of know a little bit about houses and how they're put together. And what you see on the outside really is just exterior. Get it? It's what's underneath the sheetrock or the brick or the wood siding or whatever, the carpet or whatever. <clears throat> it's the frame that really holds that house together, the foundation and the frame. And, and we have a frame in our bodies that makes this big bag of skin and blood and guts and meat it's what makes it look like what it looks like. Let's get into this. The first scripture we're going to go to is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Notice that word household. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That means Old and New Testament. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Notice verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, one of the things that I'm pointing out here in these verses is the idea that he used the idea of fitly framed together. In other words, that old spiritual that says the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bone connected to the shin bone, shin bone connected to the knee bone, knee bone the thigh bone, thigh bone hip bone. God is the one who took the stones of our bones. And if you think about what bones are made of, primarily calcium. Everybody's got to have calcium in their body to have good, strong bones. Primarily, and calcium is a rock. It's a mineral that you dig up out of the ground. We have to eat or drink things that have a lot of calcium in it so our body can replenish our bones and keep our bones healthy and strong. But God took basically rocks out of the ground. We are made out of the dust of the earth and he took those rocks and he fitly framed them together. He didn't just throw a pile of rocks and said, boy, that looks good. No, he took each piece and fitted them together because this joint fits in perfectly with this joint. And they are then connected together by tendons, by ligaments and so on. They're, they're connected together so that they don't easily pull apart. They can be. They don't easily, they're not easily pulled apart. So he fitly framed together. And I, I look at it like this. Let's apply it to just our, not just our physical bodies, but let's say the body of a marriage and a family and a home. Also the body of a group of believers like here at Bethel Church. Or, and watch the wisdom of this or other churches, or of the entire church in general. Everybody at every point in time who is considered by God to be part of the body of Jesus Christ. If I were to apply it to my body, I know that this finger fits in well here. This finger does not have any place to fit like right here. Okay, I don't have like a piece of a finger sticking out of my chin. God designed this piece to fit in with this piece. In my home. I didn't realize this at the time. When I married my wife, I didn't realize just how well I fit in with her life and just how well she fits in with my life. I didn't realize it at the time. But God put us together. He, he framed my piece, fitted it together with her piece, and together we form this collective, and then God gave his children, and they're our children, they fit in with us, and God fitly framed us together. Here at Bethel, 
We have, I've been here 20 years, we have a group of people, some from the Bethel of old that's been around here for years, some that God has brought into this place, but they all, I'm just marveling at the people that move here and that God has sent here. These people fit in so well with the rest of us. We are fitly framed together as a body of believers. Then you have the entire uh, group of people who make up the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, you have this church over here, this church over here, this church down here. And there are some churches that belong to the foot that don't fit in well with the hand. I want you to follow that. We don't all see things the same way. We don't all agree on everything. This church and how God has them doing things and even some of the things they believe, not all, but some of the things they believe doesn't fit in well with some churches up here. And they're not designed for that. God makes that church fit in with this church over here that kind of fits in with this church over here. And I don't know if you recognize this. If you run with a certain group of believers, certain other churches, maybe you're a pastor, and you have your pastoral friends, and you guys pretty much see it eye to eye, and then you have this group over here, and you don't want to say they're heretics, but you don't agree with everything they believe. But then it's something that between your group and this group over here, there's guys that you know and people you know that don't seem to have a problem fitting in with that group and this group over here. Okay? You, you know people like that, don't you? Just think about how my little toe on my right foot is actually connected to this fingertip right here. But it's at a distance, all right? That little toe fits in very good with the feet bones. The feet bones connect very well in with the ankle and the shin bones and the knee bones and the thigh bones and all up the backbone and down the arm bone and to the finger bone. The finger bone doesn't always get along with the toe bone church. But they're connected together. And when Christ comes, trumpet sound, he's going to raise his body up, the church, the body of his believers. We're all going to the same place, okay? Just keep that in mind. Oh, I'm not saying we should get along like the ecumenical movement. What I'm saying is Jesus knows how to fit every piece of his believers in all together. And this idea that, well, it's our doctrine and we believe we have the right way and only us are going to heaven. I don't go for that stuff. Okay? I mean, I just, I know there's people out there don't agree with everything I say. That does not mean that they're lost. It means they don't fit in with me very well. So they're way down on, or I'm way down on the foot, and they're way up here on the finger. It's the same lungs, same heart, same blood, same mind that controls everything, and God fitly framed all the pieces of the church together. Have you ever, and I'll do it like this, okay? Have you ever met that woman that you said, Ain't no way in the world I'd ever be married to her. Ain't no way in the world I could put up with that. Ain't no way in the world, right? But she's married to a guy that loves her to death. And you, in your mind you're going, I don't see how he puts up with that, but I couldn't put up with it. God didn't design you to put up with her. That's why you're not married to her. God designed him to put up with her. See how, or her, him. See how it works? God knows how to put all the pieces together. He really does. He's been doing it for thousands of years. He's good at it, and so I trust him in it. And I'm, I'm, I'm loving this already. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, think about it, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, there it is again, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And what I've learned is every little piece has its part. Christ fitly joins together the pieces of the body, and it increases the body unto the edification of the body. Think about it. The mind receives a signal from the stomach, we're hungry. 
the hands know that their responsibility in that is to grab food, shove it down the mouth. But the hands aren't the ones that have to get up and walk over to the pantry or the refrigerator or the shelf or wherever or your secret stash of food so the kids don't get in it, right? Your feet are the ones who have to carry you over there. That's their part of edification. And then the hands reach over and grab the food. That's their part of the edification. And they pick it up and put it in the mouth. Now the mouth is going to work. It's going to send the food down to the body. And what's happened is the entire body has helped out in getting food down into not one, if it, listen, if you have no feet and no legs, how are you going to get the food? How are you going to do that? Got to have feet and legs to carry you over there. Got to have a backbone to stabilize the body. Got to have these arms to work, to manipulate, so to put the hands in place, and the hands have to work to get, I mean, this, this Bible's right. God is so wise when he wrote this thing out. If you just ponder this for a while, you'll realize that there are some people in your family that actually do the legwork for the family. <laughs> there are some people in your family that are all hands. There are some people in your family that are all mouth. There are some people in your church that's that way, all right? There, there are churches that are that way. And I, I, God's teaching me that. God is showing me that. Mike, just because they criticize you, Mike, just because they don't agree with you, that doesn't mean that they're lost. That doesn't mean that they're reprobate. They just serve a different function in the body of Christ. And I'm learning to deal with that. I'm learning to live with that. And I can live with that. As long as they are God's people, I can live with it. So anyway, every part of the body benefits the body and makes increase of the body so that the body itself can edify itself and do so in love. So you're sitting there on the couch one day and your stomach is going, hey, we're empty down here, need some food. There's actually a hormone. I learned this when I had surgery. There's a hormone called ghrelin. It's called the hunger hormone. It's the hormone that goes up to your brain and says, if you don't eat in the next five minutes, you're going to die. Okay? I mean, we're just, I'm, and I'm, we're going to keep beating on the door harder and louder and faster until you go put some food in your stomach. And you're sitting on the couch watching your favorite TV show, bowl game or whatever, and you're going, I don't want to get up. Can, so, can somebody bring me some food? And there's nobody there. So you have to get up. Your feet have to do some walking. Your arms have to do some reaching. Your back has to do some supporting. You're going to have to get up and go get you some food. The whole body works together to, make, to edify itself, to make sure it keeps itself a lot. There's so much wisdom in this Bible. Look at how important the bones are in relation to history, relation to Bible doctrine, relation to Bible prophecy. Genesis 2.23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of, out of man. God took a rib out of Adam, and, and a rib contains bone, meat, blood, has all of that. And God took that and he made a woman and brought her to the man. 2 Samuel 5, 1, then, all, then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Psalm 34, 20, he keepeth all his bones. Look at that. Not one of them is broken. Job 10, 11, thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh and hast fenced me with bones and sinew. Sinews are basically, what is it? Ligaments, I think. Ligaments that connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. But ligaments, which are the sinews, connect bone with bone. All right? That's what the sinews are. And I, I love this verse. Uh, they came to David. We are thy bone and thy flesh. David is a picture of Christ. The people that came to him in Hebron saying, we're your church, David. We're your body. Okay? You tell us what to do. See, the head is David. The head is Christ. The, head, the body doesn't tell the head what to do. The head commands the body. Now, the body prays, and we're going to see that in a minute. The body prays to the head, but the head is the one in charge. The head is the one that says, Mike, move your left arm. See how it worked? Okay? The arm didn't tell the head, hey, think something for it. Okay? I'm having, I'm having fun with this. I like it because I know where I'm going to go with this. All right? But you see the importance of bones in the Bible. If you want to study that 2 Samuel 5 again, these people came to David. Us, we came to Christ and said, Christ, we're your bone and of your flesh. 
just like the woman that God brought to Adam, just like Christ and his church. David, we're your body. You tell us what to do, we'll do it. We, we belong to you. We are joined together with you. And then Ezekiel 37. See, I'm smiling. I got something I'm going to show you. Ezekiel 37. You might want to open your Bible up to that. Read along with me as I put it up on the screen. This is that story of the foot bone connected to the ankle bone. All right? This is where it comes from. And watch the language that God uses in this. Okay? What God says about these bones. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Right now they're dead. They're not just dead. They're very dead. They are dry bones out in the wilderness somewhere. There's no meat on them, no blood, no marrow in the bones left. They're very, very dry. They're very brittle. And they're decaying away. And yet God knows how to resurrect things that are dead. That's what he does. So watch this. Watch how it's done. Ezekiel 37.1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, notice I have this underlined, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. Ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, what's in this is, is that God is going to cause breath to enter into them. He's going to lay sinews upon them. He's going to bring up flesh upon them. He's going to cover them with skin, and put breath in them, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Right now, Israel has an identity problem in that they don't know how to identify their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've got some weird God that has, you know, relations with Shekinah, and the glory comes out. I mean, that's Baal and Ashtaroth stuff. They just call it Jehovah and Shekinah, or Yahweh and Shekinah. But they are very, very, very far removed from the gospel and from Moses. They're very far removed from that. They did exactly what God told them not to. They've added their own traditions to the law and it's got their head all messed up. So they're very dry and they're very dead and yet God is going to bring, he's going to build them back together. He's going to put them back together. He's going to give them life. They're going to stand. Think about it now. Bones are laying. They've fallen. Dead people fall. Live people stand. God's going to have them stand in the last days. He's going to put his breath into them and at that point they're going to know who the Lord is. They're going to know who the Messiah is. It won't be a mystery to them. The veil of Moses is coming off and they're going to go, that's Jesus. Those Goyim Gentiles were right. It's Christ, the Lord. See, that's what's going to happen. All right, watch this. So in, in verse 7, So I prophesied as I commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, there's something I want to point out to you, all right? If you go back to uh, verse 5 and 6, You'll notice that God said, I will cause breath to enter into you. He said it in verse 5, and he said it in verse 6, put breath in you. So Ezekiel prophesied those words, and they came together. Bones came together, sinews connected the bones, flesh and muscle and blood and skin covered them. But they're still laying there. They're dead. They don't have any breath in them. Then... And Ezekiel prophesies this to them. And so then Ezekiel prophesies again, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Now he prophesied breath the first time. They didn't stand. They didn't receive the breath. So he prophesies breath again. Then they receive it. Now watch this. There is a double outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was typically done and fulfilled at Pentecost. But not everything that Peter quoted Joel of took place at Pentecost. The sun was not darkened. The moon did not turn to blood. 
uh, and all of those great signs and wonders in the heavens did not take place. What does that mean? It means that they have a future fulfillment when God is going to breathe once again His Holy Spirit and Israel is going to receive the double outpouring or the double portion, of, just like Elisha asking Elijah, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I go, then you'll get it. And what that is, is the generation that see, of, of Israel that sees us go up into heaven without dying. Rapture. They're going to receive the double portion, the double blessing, the double outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel prophesies the first time, that's Jesus comes, the Holy Spirit's poured out, Israel doesn't receive it. Jesus, or son, the Son of Man prophesies the second time, oh, come from the four winds. Four, four winds. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Four winds. Whew. It's going to blow breath in them and they're going to go, and they're going to stand up a mighty army of God. Oh, I love this. This Bible's right, all right? There's something else I want to show you about this. That's why I'm smiling. Okay. What I did was I took the words that God said, this is the words that I want you to tell the bones. I took those words, I had them underlined for you. What I did was count them. In Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 5 and 6, those words total 50. In Ezekiel 37 verse 9, those words underlined total 16. Take a look at it. 66 words exactly that Ezekiel prophesies to the bones and when they get the 66 words they stand and are full of the Holy Spirit. 66 books in this book. 66 words here. What's the analogy? This book is going to be preached to Israel. All 66 of them, not just the Old Testament, not just the law, all of it is going to be prophesied to Israel in the last days and it's going to cause them to live. I, I love this Bible. This King James, I love this. Okay, and Watch this. In verse 11, we see the result of it. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. There is a, not only the prophecy here, but the practical application. Anything in your life that you see as being dead, maybe you and your spouse are not getting along, or maybe your children have gotten away from the Lord and you think it's lost and hopeless and you know they're dead and you don't think they're ever going to come back to the Lord. Trust me. Okay? Any idea in your mind that you think is hopeless and lost, get your Bible out and read it. God will breathe new life back into your dreams. God will breathe new life back into hope that you lost years ago. God will breathe new life into that. God will give you a reason for getting up out of bed every day. I promise you that's how it's going to happen. All right? Here's another little uh, prophecy in the Bible about bones. And it's about somebody rising back up because of the bones. 2 Kings 13, 21. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold... They spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Can you imagine that? Here's this guy dead. They didn't embalm back then. They just wrapped him up and was lowering his body down into the sepulcher where Elisha had been buried. Elisha's bones were there. And the second he touched Elisha's bones, New life came back into him, and he stood up, and, there, and everybody's holding the ropes going, I, I don't know what to do. What, what do I do? Let go of the rope, okay? <laughs> Help the guy out. He's six feet down, and he's alive. Let the guy out. I love stuff like this, all right? What, here's what your bones do. Not only do they provide 
the skeletal system, the frame, they also provide the white and the red blood cells. That which gives you life. Red blood cells, we, we talked about that. They're the carriers of the nutrients and the oxygen. The white blood cells kill off that which is unclean. And the moment this dead man touched the bones of Elisha, he raised back to life again. Man, I like this. Ephesians 5.30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are, it's just what I said a while ago. Any place where there is a body, whether it's your personal physical body or the body of your home or let's say the body of a church or the entire church gathered together in the last days, that's the body. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So, as we've been seeing with everything that we've talked about so far in this series, what we're seeing is, number one, the gospel is in every part of our body. It's in our red blood cells. It's in the idea that we are the temple of God. But in this case here, the gospel can be seen in the bones. What God is doing, the work of God, the handiwork of God, the methods of God, the numbers and the order and the patterns of God, they are all represented in our bones and in our skeletal structure. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the skeleton. We're going to deal with the back, the legs, the hands, the arms, the skull. We're going to deal with all of those. First of all, we're going to deal with the back. Take a look at this. This is a picture of your backbone, of your spine. You can see that it provides, it basically is the stand or the tree or the trunk upon which the whole body is joined together. In other words, the legs are connected to the hips, but the hips at the sacrum are connected to the backbone. The backbone, the, your hands are connected to your arms, your arms are connected into your shoulders, your sh shoulders tie in to your backbone. Your head sits right on top of your backbone. So e everything about our body eventually connects to the spine or the backbone. This is what I like. Take a look at this. There are 30 three bones in your spinal column. And we look at that verse, the whole body fitly joined together. We're joined into Christ. Think of that number 33. Who had that number on them? Christ did when he died. When he bore our transgressions and our sins to the cross, he was 33 years old. All right. Now he's timeless. He's ageless. All right. But 33. Christ is or our backbone, I'll say it this way, our backbone is the representation of Jesus Christ, the one with whom the whole body is fitly framed and joined together. All right? Places in the Bible, I got to show you this, places in the Bible that sort of show forth the idea of the back or the backbone or the spine or what it represents. All right? Now watch this. I learned this a long time ago when I started counting things in the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in your Bible. That's an odd number, which means if you were to divide them by two, you're going to have one as a remainder, which means that there is going to be a middle chapter, and there's going to be an equal amount of, I think it's 594 on this side, 594 on that side. You're going to have an equal amount of chapters on both sides and you're going to have one chapter that's in the exact chapter middle of your Bible because uh, 1189 divided by 2 is a, it's an odd number and so you're going to have a remainder of one. That one chapter, look at this, okay? Even the printing of my Bible, the book, this is called the spine of the book. The spine, if I looked at this, my old Bible, and it's held together pretty good. But the spine is where all of these pages are stitched and glued together. All of the pages of my Bible are joined together at the spine. Inwardly, your Bible has a spine. That middle chapter of the Bible, it has a spine. It is how all of the other chapters of the Bible are connected into this one chapter. It's Psalm 117. 
You can turn there in your Bible. Psalm 117. Okay? And when you get there, start the video again. Because I want you to notice that Psalm 117 is actually the shortest chapter of your Bible. It only has two verses in it. What I want you to do is stop the recording just for a minute. Stop whether you're watching on internet, YouTube, a sermon audio, or you're watching DVD or whatever. I want you to hit pause just for a minute. And I want you to stop and I want you to count the exact number of words in verse 1 and verse 2 together. All right? I'll give you a couple seconds. One, two. That's all you get. How many did you come up with? 33. The spine chapter of your Bible has exactly 33 words in it. Now, I didn't do that. King James didn't do that. Francis Bacon, or was it Ham, Hocks, and Bacon? Anyway, one of the Bacon brothers, they didn't do that. The Illuminati didn't do it. God did. He put a spine on the outside of your Bible, put a spine on the inside of your Bible. 33 words, and notice, you know, the Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. The last part of verse 2 says, And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> this Bible not only is truth, it'll be truth forever. All right? And you, now you know why I had a big smile on my face. I mean, here's the picture of it here. The spine of the outside of your Bible and the spine on the inside of your Bible. 33 words in Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people. For His merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. I like that. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of a story in the Bible where a back or the back of somebody was the, like the centerpiece of the story. Can you think of one? Here's what I want you to do. How many, how many bones in the spine? 33. How many words in Psalm 117, the spine chapter? 33. I want you to go to Exodus 33. You ready? Exodus 33. Let's look at this story. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. Moses wanted to see God. God said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Think about it. 33 bones in the spine, 33 words in the spine chapter of your King James Bible. 33, the number for Jesus. And God showed him his spine, his back, in Exodus 33. What was he showing him? Showing him the one who went to Golgotha carrying the cross on his back when he was 33 years old. Okay? Man, I love this. Watch this. Okay? See, I, I just... I'd rather talk about this stuff than the Illuminati and the Masons and the Vatican and all that. I mean, I would rather talk about this stuff any day because it, it brings happiness and joy to me. And I hope it does you too. To know that we really didn't come from monkeys or some pool of goo where lightning struck and amino acids came together and all of a sudden every component necessary to make a human cell including its DNA and its ability to reproduce all just showed up at once. I, it doesn't work. And the more I find out about this Bible and the more I know about the human body, the more science knows about the human body. It just absolutely amazes me and I love talking about this stuff. Now, I want you to get this because Ask the question, what is inside your spinal column? What is inside those 33 bones? The brain is connected back here to an electrical cord, all right? That electrical cord is called your spinal cord. And it's hooked into your brain 
and it goes down the back, down through the middle of the spinal column and communicates with your body. If I touch this right here, I felt that. I had to have a test. The doctor wanted to see if, you know, I had diabetes. The doctor wanted to see if I could feel things, so he said, turn your head. And I'm going, if I got a cough, no, turn your head. And what he was doing, he was taking like a very soft gauze and he was touching parts of my leg. And he says, I want you to tell me when you feel this. I felt every one of them. I mean, I got feeling down there. But even without looking, he would brush up against it and I would feel it. Why? It's my brain. Even, watch this. Right arm. Raise up. Touch your head. See, it works, doesn't it? I can do it again. I can do it again. My brain is communicating with my right arm. What about my left arm? My brain's communicating with my left arm. Okay, do that. And it's doing that, all right? My brain is doing all that. My brain is communicating with all the areas of the body. How does that work? Here we go. Take a look at this. That spinal column at every bone, all 33, you have a bundle of nerves. One comes out on the right side. One comes out on the left side. So you have 33 bones, 33 nerve bundles coming out of the 33 bones of your spine. One comes to the right, one comes to the left. Do the math. 33 on the left side, 33 on the right side. What do you have? 66. How does God, the head, Jesus, communicate with the body? 66 nerve bundles. Some on the left, some on the right. I love this. How do those, what, what does it use? Does it use sonar? Does it use microwaves? Does it use internet? Kinda. Kinda does. Internet is basically a series of electronic pulses at high speeds sending out a code of zeros and ones. Your spinal cord operates pretty much the same way electrical impulses. Electrical impulses whereby the brain sends impulses down to the body. The body then directs, or excuse me, the spinal cord then directs that down to the right place. I, I'm, I'm watching my newest grandson grow. He's a baby right now. And I've just watched him every morning. And at some point he went from this lifeless, ah, to now he's got the curiosity of a baby. And you put anything, into, touch anything to his hand and his hand immediately closes on it. And of course he's at the age now where when you put it in his hand, he closes on it, goes to mouth, okay? Immediately. His dad and I still have that impulse. If you put it in the hand, it goes to the mouth, all right? But anyway, he's learned, his brain is connecting things together to learn how to, to move his hands in order to be able to, he can't write his name yet. He can't put a square block in a round hole or a square hole. He can't do that yet, but it won't be long. And he's going to be able to learn how to do something as minute as signing his name on a piece of paper or maybe even learning how to do art, which I don't know how to do. Or you may learn how to play the piano or the banjo. All of that requires that. And what it is, the brain sends the signals down by way of electrical impulses to the hands, the ears, hear the sound. The brain works out the music. The brain works out how that music is to sound and it tells the fingers, this is how we strum, this is the keys that we touch and so on. I mean, it's complex, but it's absolutely amazing, all right? You, and here's what I'm showing you. This is all done by electricity. There is not, the word electricity does not exist in your Bible. Lightning does, and it's the same thing. Lightning is electrical impulses, electrical shock. That's what it is. Watch this, okay? How, how does God speak? What does God's voice sound like? 
Job 37. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it unto the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. And after it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. Psalm 77, 18, the voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Matthew 24, 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And who's the Son of Man? He's the Word of God. He's the, and He comes as electrical impulses. The brain tells the body by way of 66 connections. This is what I want you to do. And it's the same way that God, when God spoke, sounded like thunder and lightning, and the guys wrote it down, and God, the head, now speaks to us, the body, through here. The hands don't move, but what the head tells them to. And there's this doctrine floating around, right? And it's been going around for years that, well, the church is supposed to be the body, and yet the body's not doing what the head tells it to do. If we were doing what the head tells it to do, we would all be missionaries in Africa and in New Guinea and all that. I don't go for that stuff. I don't fall for it. I think the head, when it decides that the body's going to do something, the body does it. God is control of his body. Jesus, is in, Jesus the head is in full control of the body. The body, we don't have palsy. Right? We don't have some debilitating disease as the church that keeps us from doing what needs to be done. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Of course, his people do what he tells them to do. But somebody on the outside saying, Ooh, I'm getting something from God. It's not in the Bible. Ooh, I get that from God. You stay away from that rascal. He's lying through his teeth. God's already spoken to the church, and it's in this book. Left side, right side, Old Testament, New Testament, it's all right here in the Word of God. The devil hates the Word of God. Take a look at this. Kundalini, you've heard me talk about that. Yoga, Eastern mysticism, going into trances, whereby the idea of Kundalini activation is that there is a serpent at the base of your spine, and the serpent's going to rise up the 33 bones, the 66 impulses, and take over the head. Think about it. What, did, what did Lucifer say? He is down to the ground. That's the base of your spine. And he's going to rise up to be like the most high. That's your head. Kundalini activation is nothing more than enthroning Lucifer. And he now is going to dictate and tell the body. He, remember, he wants to rise up and rule over the mount of the congregation. That's the body. And anybody who practices kundalini, they've got this devil that is rising up, taking over their mind and controlling them. And the devil wants to sit and be the head and control the church. Boy, you think about that. And how is he going to do it? By suppressing the Bible. You know what happened? You know what he's wanting to activate? The serpent? The pineal gland. Did you know that Every night when I go to sleep, I don't read my Bible while I'm asleep. I don't. Don't read a word of it. When the pineal gland is activated, it puts the body to sleep. And it suppresses most of what the head is telling the body. You get it, don't you? Think of those nerve bundles coming down the 33 bones, one on the left, one on the right. I'm going to show you this because remember, the impulses that go up and down, and by the way, how does the body tell the mind what's going on? By the same path. This is prayer to God. God speaking to us is through his word. And when the stomach is hungry, it releases this hormone called ghrelin, tells your brain we need to get something to eat or you're going to die. Okay. When this hand feels pain, the signals direct this other hand to come over here and soothe the pain. See how it works? This is the part of the body that's communicating to the brain. This is us as the body praying to the head, and the head is hearing our prayers and sending relief and comfort. Oh, I love this. 
okay? Think of the head now. The head is the one that tells the body what to do. The head is the ruler. So think of the 33 bones and the 66 nerve bundles. Let's look at the 33rd book of the Bible and the 66th book of the Bible. 33rd book of the Bible is Micah. Micah chapter 5. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Notice he's ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And then look at Revelation 19.11. Notice the 33rd book speaks of him as the ruler, the head. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Think about it. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's his body, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Seize the ruler... And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. See that? 33rd book of the Bible, he's the ruler coming from Bethlehem. 66th book of the Bible, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords to come down to rule in the 66th book of the Bible. Oh, I like this. Now we're going to talk about the feet. Now let me take a look at the picture. In your feet, you have 26 bones, but you have 33 joints. Now, I found this out, and, and I'll talk about this the next time. Your hand has 27 bones. Your feet has 26 bones. But together with your hand, your radius, your ulna, and your whatever this is, forgot what it is, you have 30 bones in your whole arm plus your hand. Even though you have 26 bones in your feet, you have 30 bones in each leg because what, whatever bone is missing out of the foot is made up for by the kneecap. So you still have 30 bones from your hips down, each leg, 30 bones from, that's 120, we'll get to that. But anyway, you have 26 bones in your foot, but you have 33 joints, right? So I like this. 33 is Christ, all right, and Calvary and the cross. Watch what your Bible says. Joshua 1, 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Sole of your foot with 33 joints in it, taking dominion over what it steps on. Revelation 10, 1, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea, 33, and his left foot on the earth, 33. So his right foot and his left foot together make 66 joints. This book, this book takes dominion. Wherever it goes, this book takes over. This book takes dominion over your life. It takes dominion over your body, your family. This book takes dominion over your church. This book, wherever it goes, is in charge. Every place that it's read, believed, Mm, mm, mm. I see, don't you love this stuff? Now look at this now. The two feet together with 33 joints in each foot represent the 66 books of your Bible. Dominion. Look at this. Luke 8, 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed <laughs> sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I, I, I noticed this years ago. We used to have a little dog, and, you know, we still do. It's a different dog. But this little dog, I noticed, I just watched her nature, okay? And whenever she would just kind of roam around the house for a little while, when she came into the living room and I was sitting on the love seat or the couch, you know what she'd do? 
she comes sit down right at my feet. The Holy Ghost showed me that. It's Mike, she is sitting under your dominion. She is actually placing herself in subjection to you. She knows, because God designed her that way. She knows who her master is. And if her master says, do this, okay, if she's trained well, she'll do it. But Mike, she sits at your feet showing that you are her Lord. Look at this guy. He, Jesus delivered him from legion, 144 devils inside this man. Delivered him. And where does he sit? At the 66 joints of Jesus' feet. He puts himself under the dominion of the word of God. Luke 10, 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And look at it heard his word. See, it connected it together, didn't it? Acts 14, 8, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. He was lame in his feet, which means he didn't read and believe his Bible. Because he didn't read and believe his Bible, he had no power to stand against his enemies. And when Peter saw him, he said, stand upright on thy feet. And what he did was he put strength into his feet. Now he can stand. And what this means is this man now says the Bible is the word of God and I'm going to read it and study it and meditate on it and I'm going to let God apply it in my life because it's powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. See, isn't that beautiful? Study feet in the Bible. Okay? Study, study it. Here's some more. Think of the 66 joints, the dominion of the Bible. Think of the 10 toes. 10 is the number for dominion. The law hath dominion over a man, and there's 10 commandments. The 10 toes of Daniel's, or excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is the fourth kingdom that has dominion over the earth. It represents the curse of the law. Because God said, I'm going to send a nation to you whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. And that's the fourth kingdom. And so here's the ten toes, and they have dominion over the earth. And yet Jesus comes, he's the stone cut without hands, and he destroys the ten toes. And once you destroy the feet, what happens to the image? It cannot stand. Remember Dagon? Dagon is fallen. Is fallen. It happened twice, didn't it? Oh, I love this stuff. Okay. Mm, 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 mm. So watch this. Watch how this works. Romans 10, 15. How should they preach except they be sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet. Think of your Bible. Of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 16, 20. 20. Look at this. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan where? Under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. You want power over the devil? Your power is right here in the 66 books, just like the 66 joints of both your feet together. That's where your power is. We used to play a game when I was growing up. It's called by different names. I won't get into that. But basically, it was whoever had the football, you throw the football up in the air, and whoever was brave enough to catch it, he had to try to run around, stay in the yard, try to run around, and so that, see if people could tackle him. Okay? And once you got him on the ground, all you got to do is step on him. Stand on top of him. He's not getting up. Okay? It's dominion. King of the hill stuff. Joshua 10. That's the story I had in my mind and I almost blurted it out a while ago. Okay? Get ready. Joshua 10, 24. They have the five kings. Five represents death. All right? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Look at this. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. 
And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. You see it? He must reign until he's put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Come near and put your feet upon the necks of these kings. Be strong and of good courage. The dominion and the power of the word of God will cause you to stand against all your enemies and take victory over them. It will. Psalm 8, 6, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Psalm 47, 3, He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Psalm 66, look at it. 66 joints, 66 books in the Bible, which holdeth our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. You know what that means, don't you? That means you're walking and you don't slip. He doesn't suffer or allow your feet to be moved. This Bible, once you get it in your life, is static. It's unmovable. It is unshakable. God's going to shake heaven and earth one of these days. And even the angels are going to fall down from heaven when God shakes them like he's shaking a tree. And he's going to shake the earth too. And he says those things that remain will not be shaken. We'll be standing while everybody else falls. Okay? Hmm. Psalm 91, 3. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Look at that. The lion, the dragon, we know who that is. That's our enemy. And God will give, right now we have this flesh. And right now the devil owns it. And you know what? He can have it. One of these days, God is going to give us dominion even over Satan. He's going to put him under our feet. Psalm 119.59, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Verse 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 33 joints in your feet, 66 all together. God's going to bless your feet. God's going to give your feet stability. God's going to allow you to stand with your feet. God's going to strengthen your feet. As you read, study, meditate on, think on this Bible, God will bless your life and He will give you the power to stand. He will give you the power to stand and not fall away when the falling away comes. And this stuff lovely? It just, you read this, and now you'll never read the Bible the same. Anytime you see a foot or, your, or a feet, you're going to go, I know what that is. I know what that is. Okay? I know what, that I know what the symbolism is here. I know what that represents. All right? That's what you're going to do. This is why I'm doing this. God has shown me this stuff, and I'm just going, Lord, you are so amazing. I rejoice and praise him. Mm. Man, I love this so much. Such a blessing to know that this Bible, not written by men, but written by God, preserved for us. And now we look at it knowing, how, how did they know 500 years ago or 4,000 years ago how many joints there were in the feet? They didn't know that. We know it now. We know how it works. We know it's in the Bible. We put the two things together and we see the correlation. We see that we were actually designed and fitly framed together. This bone goes into this bone by this joint. And Christ, 33, he's the joint that connects us together. Or, it's his word. You see, there's a lot of people that watch my videos. They don't all agree with me on everything. That's fine. It's the Bible, however, this Bible, that has connected us all together. And we don't have to see everything eye to eye. We don't have to be all exactly the same.
that we are connected together by this book, just like the joints in our feet. All right? I love you. We'll pick up, the, there's only going to be two parts to this. We'll pick up the second. I got to talk about the hands, the skull. You're going to like this too, all right? We're going to finish this up the next time we get together, all right? I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope you enjoy it. You pray for us. We thank God for you. You're the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.